one thing that came up recently that maybe uh, we can I can get your um, also insight on Sheikh is um, there's brothers who are posting about um, if you can use breathing like to manipulate your breathing to get almost like a high you know what I mean so you like it's, you almost get like an intoxicated state right so like you can you can actually do this by like doing certain breathing things where you can get like this intoxicated state you know and uh, you know because there's a it, there is a health component in breathing properly and te- learning how to breathe and stuff like that but then some people take it to the extreme where they manipulate their breathing where they get almost like this high and it's like oh this is a halal high you know type of thing what are your thoughts on that it seemed like okay somebody has a little bit too much time in their hand because you're you're literally like Manipulating your who has time to manipulate your breathing? You know what I mean? And sit there. Actually, honestly, it's the first I hear. Of this. Yeah. I mean, so this uh, is a fresh. What's the fresh result? Fatwa for Does you? a person basically get? Uh, high? Yeah, what yeah. They can get. You can get an intoxicated like, state. Like you mean, can, like as if you're drunk. Well, yeah. You can be like almost like dizzy and like a little bit euphoric. You okay. can get euphoria. Yes. Blood rush, right? Yeah, you can get a, some type of euphoria. I don't know if it's similar to how like you know you have the swirling dervishes. Maybe I don't know. Like. If you spin yourself really, yeah. really fast, you get you to know? that point of dizziness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you get dizziness and a sense of euphoria. So, do you get the question? Jeff? The question I got it, but then uh, see when you this type of uh, scenario, if it's more like, for example, the swirling dervishes, yeah. it's not exactly a high. Yeah, it's a euphoria, but not an intoxicated state where you, yeah. because see, like uh, intoxication within Islam, yeah, and it's basically what clouds your judgment, your mind. Yeah. So you're unable to st- think straight. So one who gets drunk, yeah. taking excessive amounts of alcohol, where they're now impaired. Yes. So the question is more: Does it give you that state of impairment or not? Yeah, I don't think it does. If it, it's simply that euphoric state where you're on a high, but a different type of high, basically like yeah. an extreme amount of joy. Yeah. Yeah, it's not exactly an impairment, but the question here is: it dangerous to your health? Yes. If it is dangerous to your health, and this falls under a different guideline, now that or what Yeah. So just really, uh, you need someone to kind of really. I don't elaborate. know what the, the the feeling is or the experience that yeah. people have. This is the first I hear of it. Yeah, yeah. So no, know. but people can get like they say they get high. They get wow. like that's the way that non-Muslims describe it, yeah. and they are obviously familiar with all sorts of other types right. of intoxications right. but the way you describe it is well you get like a natural high or like, yeah. or like you know you get a high by con- manipulating your breathing right see, there's different substances that we have that yeah. will give you a certain high but see the word high even yeah. in Arabic we're talking about it it'll give you different perceptions so there's yes. a certain high when someone takes you know the al-qat yes the al-qat they'll chew on it and they yeah. get them to a certain state of high and it's a euphoria yeah. where he just kind of slows down just yeah. really slows down and yeah. he, he feels everything it just kind of gets yeah. him to that state where yeah and he, you're, you're interfering with your normal mm. body processes basically okay. so this would be haram because it interferes with the body process okay. getting stoned on marijuana it doesn't make you it doesn't per se make you drunk like alcohol yes but it still is haram because of the harm that it has upon your body mm. and as well it interferes with the the functions either yeah. speed when you speed up your functions yeah or you slow them down yeah. you can't do that this is haram okay yeah so it would fall maybe within that realm but like i said it has to be yeah. you have to double check into it and see yeah, you'd have yeah. to look into the yeah. details of that yeah because yeah. like I, I'll, I'll look into it after inshallah but uh, yeah it's interesting i mean because I, I, I know this is different than there was like this uh, trend on social media where people would choke themselves yeah and okay, then they, yeah. Would, they would choke themselves and then they would kind of stop and they would get like this like almost yeah, euphoric state yeah yeah exactly that's haram because you're, yeah. you're choking yourself and yeah some other people are doing some choking something else and they uh, yeah. <laughs> they kill themselves <laughs> yeah some yeah. actors they're not talking about so yeah 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 exactly that, that is outright because that, that it falls under that guideline which yes. is a very broad guideline right yeah. you're not harm yourself or others yeah because in the end this body is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah we're simply here to maintain it make sure that it's you know we we don't harm it in any way yeah and then if we do, that's where the tahrim falls into it, right? Maqasid of sharia, of which, yeah, and protecting your deen, your of which is also a, your your body, yes. right? Your intellect as well in your body. So these are all part of that package. Islam yeah. is designed to protect all of these things. The mm-hmm. fundamental, you know, you can say aims of sharia are these the five. Yeah, are uh, there are there any like substances that you see people don't know? that it's haram but it actually is haram well there is to me when i look at uh, substances that are haram the biggest issue that we should look at is the presence of ethyl alcohol ethyl in, alcohol yeah in amounts that would be uh, even if they're called trace amounts to me yeah. 
uh, it's still haram, yes. even if it might not intoxicate. Yes. The issue is whatever does intoxicate, let's say in an ice cap, this is one example. So the ice cap, yes. they confirm that there is um, trace amounts of alcohol in it. So okay. these trace amounts of alcohol, they put it in there to keep the consistency, yes. the flavor. So if we isolate that trace amount yeah. and multiply it, right, then we know for a fact that it will make you drunk. Yes. Rasulullah said, مَا أَسْكَرَ كَثِيرُهُ فَقَلِيلُهُ حَرَامُ Whatever in great amounts intoxicates, even its trace amount yes. would be deemed haram. Okay. So to us, even though it's not going to intoxicate you, the majority opinion is that whatever does have the potential of intoxication, yes. it also is najis, it's also impure. Okay. So this is an actual impurity. Okay. So, um, so alcohol is also impure? Yes, this is the majority okay. opinion. Hanafi, okay. Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali. Okay. Um, of course, there is a minority opinion that the impurity of, of khamar is not actual impurity, but rather uh, a metaphorical impurity. Yes. But to me, the stronger opinion is that it is an actual impurity. And okay. we have different evidences for that. What about uh, cologne? Cologne is different because here, although it does it contain ethyl alcohol, yes. the composition of the alcohol within cologne is not called ethyl, it's called denat or denatured alcohol. Okay. So it's a combination of methanol, isopropyl, and also ethanol. So yeah. if one does consume it, it does not intoxicate, it kills you. Yes. So in that case, it's a different thing. We've changed yes. its composition in that, same, yes. in that sense. So I don't see any tahrim in using okay. uh, alcohol. But ethyl perfumes. alcohol can be consumed, you're saying? Uh, yeah. Or it is consumed? It is. That's what makes you drunk. Okay. Yeah. So that it's found naturally occurring as well as it is inserted into certain drinks mm -hmm. for various purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So let's assume right now in the, this example of the ice cap mm -hmm. that we do have a known amount of trace, a trace amount of alcohol mm -hmm. within the drink. Um, that being present would indicate to it that it, it is nudges, it's impure. Mm. So people get confused, okay, purity, impurity, what does that mean? Mm. It's, it, it's used to disinfect wounds, it, definitely it is. Mm. It has that property. But purity, impurity is not a science or a medical term, it's a shara'i term. Mm. So there's certain things that are pure, certain mm. things that are impure, actually mm. or metaphorically. This is a designation of the sharia. And you have, you know, antibacterial properties, that's scientific, that's medical. So not everything that is antibacterial is actually a pure substance. During World War II, World War I, when people were wounded, they didn't have any disinfectants, so they would use urine. Mm. Urine has that, when it's like really dark yellow, it mm. does have that property of, you know, killing bacteria, disinfecting wounds, so they would use it mm. uh, when they didn't have anything. So if you get a cut and you disinfect it with, yeah. um, like say, ethyl alcohol, yeah. Like you, then is like you can pray now. No, no. Uh, uh, you you just wash your hand. You just wash your wash hand. your hand. That's it. Yeah, because you're removing it. Um, okay. But you know, uh, in World War One, World War Two, yes. when they were using these liquids, they were antibacterial, but at the same time, yeah. still najis from the Shari point of view. Okay. Urine is najasa. Mm. You know, uh, people get like I said, they confuse the terms. Mm. So, if we're to say substitute in an ice cap, and this is the mm. thing people don't kind of make that correlation. Mm. If we were to substitute the trace amounts of alcohol within the drink with trace amounts of urine, mm. you tell a person, well, you know what, this has a grade A trace amounts of, uh, of urine mm. to give it that nice consistency and flavor and color. Mm. No one will touch it. Mm. There's urine in there. Why don't yeah. you touch it? Well, it's an antibacterial yeah. product. No, yeah. we don't touch it. We don't take it. Yeah. Because it's, it's revolting, right? Yeah. But for alcohol, no. We, people mm. look at it and say, no, it's not a big deal. It's okay. Mm. See, then with the athar of najasa, in the drink, let's say someone was, you know, in a location where some alcohol poured on him. This is najasa, so you cannot perform salah in that garment, you gotta wash it. Mm. Um, and the problem is, it's not so straight cut. This is straight cut we're talking. But when it comes to more of the issues where we have alcohol on a day to day basis in our foods, that is the thing where that's, that's really distracting. You'll find it, for example, in almost anything that's sweet. Yes. So it's a substitute where they can increase the sweetness of a product mm. at a very cheap cost, right? Mm. It's always, you know, how, do, how can you make more money? Mm. So they do this to kind of increase that sellability plus profit margins, right? Mm. So it's almost everywhere, Sheikh. So you look mm. at, you know, um, any product, and I did this to my, with, with my own family. Go inside our, our kitchen, the pantry, just checking randomly for stuff because you know you buy stuff you don't realize you know mm. certain recipes require certain things mm. so we're checking in our pantry and we found pure vanilla uh, pure vanilla extract mm. which you know is used for many pastries and, yes uh, sweet dishes this has alcohol if i drink it i'll become drunk mm. right it's 35.5 percent alcohol in there so it's okay. a very high amount chef yeah so it's deadly 
I mean, if you take the whole thing one shot, you'll, you'll become woozy, you might even collapse. Mm. But it can get you impaired. Mm. So in this case, it would be deemed, you know, najasa. We should not be buying this to begin with. Mm. So there's so many things that kind of tie in with this, which is... Uh, what about hand sanitizers? They have a high percentage. They do have. But then here with hand sanitizers, you're going to have multiple types and kinds of hand sanitizers. Overall, because of the pandemic that we're in, the argument can be made that it's najasa, but because of the situation that we're in, adurat to bihal mahdurat. So in this case, we have an exceptionary rule over here mm. that states that dire needs mm. legalize that which we deem unlawful, right? Mm. So we know it to kill bacteria. It will get rid of the, you know, if let's say we have, asamahallah, COVID-19 bacteria in our hands. Mm. You use that, it'll kill it. It's been mm. proven scientifically speaking. So we can use it in that mm. regard, alhamdulillah. But let's say it was not COVID time yes. and you happen to use it, Based on this view that I take by, which is the more stricter opinion, wash your hand before you perform your salah. Yes. After. So that way you're safe, right? Even now, I mean, it Can does it, will, will it, so it'll break your wudu then? No, it, you basically it. one of the pre prerequisites of salah is that you have the purity of your body and the place of prayer. So if let's say someone performs prayer while they have najas on the body, they basically ruptured the prayer from the, from the get-go. Yes. So this is one of the prerequisites that must be present before you start praying salah. So, say like for example, you have wudu, yeah. and then you use hand sanitizer, Yeah, is your wudu broken? Well, I'm not going to go that far because here it's an area of khilaf, contemporary khilaf among scholars. But if you're going to take by the stricter opinion, your wudu is not broken, you just wash your hand, that's you it. You just wash your hand? Wash your hand, yeah, that's okay. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, what, what is your opinion, because you're telling me this, and I remember back in the day reading the book by Sayyid Sabiq, what is yes. your opinion on uh, you know his, you know, uh, book and the compilation. Yeah, it's, of it's a beautiful yes. book, mashallah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's one of the first books I've read in yes. English. Fiqh Subhanallah, Fiqh Sunnah, yes, or Sayyid Sabiq, rahmatullahi yeah. alayhi. Um, you know, he does touch on many contemporary issues. He has yeah. his own ijtihad, and yeah. you know, he brings a lot of different opinions, which yeah. I think is important, because often we've been raised up with the one opinion approach. Yes. So you know. I think in North America, yeah. his book was one of the first oh, yeah. ones where people were starting to see oh, the yeah. different uh, opinions the viewpoints, yeah, yes, yes. compared, and then it came out more. It, it, look, it, to me, it was the start of anyone's journey into ilm. Mm. Like, that would be one of the first things you have in your library. Yes. You go get that book, right? Yeah. And then you sit with the Sheikh afterwards, and they'll discuss the various opinions. Yeah. If you didn't have that book, the Sheikh could tell you, it's only this, this, and this. Yes. Straight opinions that he, he used to be the strongest, and that's it. Mm. You'll never hear of any other opinion. So when you go outside, this happened to me and many other students of knowledge, you yeah. go outside and begin to learn academically, you're like, hold on a moment, that's not right. I knew this is the only opinion, but then you realize there's like four other opinions yeah. in the masala that you covered, right? Mm. And the one that you hold to might be the weaker one. Yes. That's where the shock comes in. Yeah. So Sayyid Sabiq's book, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, um, it was, I think at the time, you know, well needed. Yes. And even now, it's like a resource that almost, I think every masjid, every library has to begin with. Mm. It's an important work, definitely, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And uh, what are your thoughts about Ibn Rushd's book as well? Oh, beautiful. Bidat, is it in English? or? Yeah. yeah oh, I haven't seen the English. But we studied that book, uh, Bidayat al-Mujtahid. Yeah. Beautiful book, mashallah. Yes. It's a comparative. Yeah. But keep in mind, there's certain, like, with He doesn't any, include the Hanafi opinion in there. Um, there is, uh, he does, he'll, he'll mention ittifaq. Yeah. So there's going to be like, it's not like, it's, look, there's, a, there's certain books that are in depth yeah. within the madahib, and there's like these encyclopedic works that just mm. touch on the mm. general opinions. Yes. That to me is his work. Okay. So it doesn't really go in, de in detail. Yes. Um, you know, with him being a Madiki to begin with, yes. he just wanted to kind of bring that encyclopedic work together mm. from an Andalus. Yeah. So you wouldn't have, back then, you know, with the, the contact that you have and the, it'll be limited in an Andalus. Mm. Uh, to the scholars who were there, and at that time, you had the Lahiri Madhab, quite strong. Uh, that it was basically um, propagated by Imam Ibn Hazm al-Lahiri, rahmatullahi alayhi, and also the Maliki Madhab. They were like in contention quite a lot, the two sides. And um, his book kind of, it's a nice book, it gathers everything together. And I personally benefited from it greatly, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. That's good. What is your um, opinion, or what you, would you suggest and advise for like the average Muslim in terms of having a book of reference for like, you know, fiqh of ibadah? Well, Sheikh, there are many now in English, so I'm yeah. not really aware of the full scope of the English library. It's expanded greatly. So mm -hmm. from the time that I'm looking back, and to be honest, I have, I prefer Arabic books because mm -hmm. time and time again, the English works, the translations kind of get, they irk me so much. Mm -hmm. I tend just to leave it in the, on the shelf as a, as a you know, shelf piece, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I have my Arabic books, um, which I use, different madahib and whatnot, mm -hmm. but 
you, it's it's worth a look. I mean, to see. I, uh, so I, not, I can't give you a response right now. Yeah, but so from Arabi, like, what would you the say? The Arabi, the essential works you'll be getting. I mean, if you're looking, it depends on what you're doing. If you're like a student or that have graduated from university, then by all means, you're going to have the key works that you should have in your library. Al mm-hmm. Mughni uh, for Ibn Qudama, rahmatullahi alayhi, as a key encyclopedic. That's a beautiful encyclopedic work. Mm-hmm. I myself have Ibn Hazm's book. Ibn Qudama's book, Al Muhalla Bil Athar for Ibn Hazm, mm-hmm. which is like a, is encyclopedic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, other for other, other madahib you can get, you know, like Al Um for Al Shafi'i, rahmatullahi mm-hmm. alayhi. But there is one that, you know, coming to think of this, there is one book that kind of, if a person does not have the luxury of buying all these books, mm-hmm. you can just choose the one book, mm-hmm. which is the encyclopedia work, encyclopedic work of the Kuwaiti Ministry of Islamic Affairs. So mm-hmm. it's, we look, we call it the Al Mosu'a Al Kuwaitiya. Mm. The Kuwaiti Encyclopedia, and it's divided by topics. So, any topic that you want mm. in fiqh, let's say you're looking for wudu, you open the cha- wow, mm. wudu gives you all the ahkam of wudu in light of the form of that, with oh, the evidences nice. and proofs. Mm. It's roughly over 25 volumes. Wow. But if you can get the one book, you're set. Mm. Alhamdulillah, everything is there. Do they have like a, like a website or an online version of that? There is on the, uh, if you have Android, it's there. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, there's nothing on. Um, the Apple, mm. there's something like very odd uh, PDF. I don't like it, mm. but in the uh, in the Android, beautiful, beautiful like uh, layout. The app is amazing. Oh really? So, oh yeah. So it's oh, the yeah. whole it's thing. The whole thing. The whole thing. Do yeah. they have a website as well? Yeah, I believe so, but I don't think it's necessarily listed over there. Oh okay. You have to okay. kind of either find the specific app. Oh okay. Or you just go get yourself the book itself. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because you know, like twenty five. <laughs> it's huge. You gotta find some good shelf space for well, that. It is, yes. But okay. then it's a book that you'll not put down. Yeah. You'll yeah. be always using it. You always use it as a reference, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. MashaAllah. No, this is a good. Zama khair, Sheikh. Uh, you know, for exactly. that. What do you think is, at this point, just to end off, what do you think are, are some of the most, uh, or the most misunderstood fiqh issue that people deal with? Well, to be very open, it's with the foods. It's the foods. Yeah, because, you know, other masail, you can pick them up. Salawat, this, that. Yeah. You picked up, you've learned it. So there'll be a basis for it. Let's say once from a Hanafi family, Madi Kishafi, yeah. you pick it up, not much of a difference. But it's with the foods where people display, a, 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 you know, no knowledge in certain masail. Yeah. To them, haram is only khinzir, pig, yes. or alcohol in the bottle. Yes. Beyond that, to some likewise, it's everything's okay. Mm. Then you'll have some who don't understand the, the terminology used in English. Because there's certain things that might appear haram, mm. but they're not haram. Mm. Right? Like chocolate liquor, for example, or liqueur. Yes. Yeah. The people are like, oh, this is haram. Yeah. So the word liquor is a, yeah. Yeah, alcohol, but it's yeah. not. Okay. So it's a, that's only a, a liquid chocolate, basically, right? Mm. So you do have the terminology in English. Yeah. And then in addition, if you look at any package, read the, the labels in the back, it's full of chemicals, preservatives. Mm. So some might be questionable. So you'd be, it's like a research. You're sitting down, going through each and every single one to see what is harmful, determine how dangerous it is, and... Uh, this is one thing that I found, even in Malaysia, uh, and I was surprised because that's why I studied about the halal foods. Even there, in the candies that are labeled halal, you find it over here, it's stamped halal, yes. right? So if you look at it, the halal there, in this context, means that there's no alcohol and no khinzir. So you're safe. But turn it around, you have all these E numbers. Yes. They're all banned in UK, in <laughs> Europe, and in Canada, <laughs> but they're here. And each one is so devastating, yeah. harmful to your health. Yeah. Um, some even cause like I, I was shocked because there's the orange color they add. Yeah. Uh, and there's a yellow color. Yeah. One of them causes hyperactivity in children. Wow. Proven, and it's banned in the in the uh, in Europe. Yes. And the second one causes some type of weird. Um, it's uh, subhanallah. It's escaped my mind, but it causes a condition. It's banned almost everywhere, but mm. it's somehow okay in the Muslim countries. Mm. So. Uh, they don't take that into into consideration. Now, darar wa la Do not harm yourself, right? Mm. You're not at liberty to go and eat something that will harm you. You got to be very careful how you, what you consume. Do you think, Sheikh, like the term or the phrase of in, in fiqh, like one of the principles, is that you know everything in the you know dunya matters is halal until proven haram, mm-hmm. and then you know in ibadah you know everything is yes. haram unless it's you know. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that term is abused sometimes? I feel sometimes, you know, mm. people kind of use that as a blanket statement to yeah. just like, you know, do a lot of different yeah, things. See, what do you think? Uh, the in terms of the first one, al asl fil ashya al hilu al ibaha, by default all things 
right? Are, are permissible. Permissible and yeah. lawful, halal. Yeah. The abuse to me is not in using this. Yeah. It's one's approach to not actually doing the research, mm. to understanding whether this is halal or not. Because mm. by default it is halal, but then there's certain things that may deem it to be haram. Yes. If you're not putting the proper work in, mm. and you know, you'll be consuming something that's not harmful to your health. But, but you know, people almost take it as a statement of being able to be ignorant about things. Yeah. So as long as that's wrong. as long as you haven't proven to me that this is haram, I can keep doing it. Yeah. So then the onus becomes that you prove it to me it's haram, or else yeah. I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. That's I, I've seen that yeah. now attitude yeah. Yeah, you know come up from people. What do you think I, I, about that? I agree with you that that, that yeah. is you know get picking up speed basically. Yeah. People, the problem is people are you know giving priority to their likes and uh, wants, mm. and they're making it as if their needs. I need to have this when yes. it's just a sweet drink or just for example a, mm. a donut. I need to have that. Yes. It's not a need. Yeah. But we've made it a need because yeah. you want that sugar in your body. Yeah. So uh, I agree with you. It's uh, one of those abused t uh, terms in the way that people, their, their attitudes are towards this, right? Mm -hmm. All it needs is a shift in the attitude to understand that, listen, this is a, an amana from Allah that you have. Your mm -hmm. body is an amana. Mm -hmm. You must take care of it to the best of your ability. If you're going to slack off, mm -hmm. there's, there is accountability in regards mm -hmm. to this. You're going to be held accountable, mm -hmm. subhanAllah. So we're not free to just to damage our bodies the way that we want. Yeah. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how, how do we balance that term? Because like, and now if, if we just not even just take food matters, but yeah. say like other, any yeah. other type of like, you know, muamalat or anything, right? Yeah. Uh, how do we then balance between like being, you know, hyper, like having this compulsive, you know, thing to yeah. verify everything and then being so laissez-faire and like, you know, it's gonna be, it's it's okay unless you prove to me and then you have yeah. to really prove to me that this is haram like before yeah. I stop doing it, right? So how do you balance that? Like whether it's with food or like anything else, you know what I mean? Sheikh, the key is over here is the balance. Yeah. You can never go to either extreme. Yeah. There's some people who go nuts and read every yeah. single label and ingredient. That's a bit insane. Yeah. And you know, uh, there's some givens, you don't have to go down that path. Like mm -hmm. for example, bread, right? And they'll be reading this, oh, this is haram because of this. These are maybe there's a, s a chance, but it's like one in a, a million. Yeah. yeah. So I don't see the, the need to go down that path of verifying mm. every single small little chemical component. Mm. If it's overall deemed to be safe, halas. There's a term we have here in the West, G-R-A-S, grass. Mm. Generally recognized as safe. It's a des designation mm. for certain substances added to the foods, right? Mm. It's been abused of late, but mm. then overall, if there's certain foods that we've been consuming mm. that we know to be healthy, nutritious, wholesome, you don't have to go down that path of verifying. Mm. Whereas on the opposite end, we have that you know, uh, inappropriate attitude of don't verify nothing. I don't care. I'm going to keep on eating and drinking. Mm. As long as I, you know, I don't have strong proof, I'm not going to bother. Mm. So that's another inappropriate attitude. We've got to find that balance, that, that middle mm. ground. So I'm not going to go to the nitty gritty of verifying every single thing in bread, for example. Mm. But I'm not going to go at the same time, just pick up a package off the shelf and eat it. Yeah. So I want to verify to an extent what's there. Yeah. There could be alcohol there. There could be, for example, other substances. Yeah. Right? So an example of you know, going a bit overboard is where a person will sit down, taking into account every single chemical component. They could be just chemicals, mm. right? Flavor enhancers, they could be whatever. And this is everywhere. So some will go to the point of saying, I will not eat any of this stuff. So then they limit themselves just to raw foods. If that's your thing, khayr, go ahead, do it, alhamdulillah. Mm. At the same time, it's not for everyone. Mm. The problem is when I, for example, take my raw food approach mm. and tell you it's haram to eat anything else. Mm. That is wrong. Whereas on the other end, the mm. person who has no sense whatsoever, just eat whatever's in front of you. Mm. That's wrong as well because you could be consuming haram. Yeah. Right? And yeah, that's, you have to have that balance, definitely, subhanAllah. Do we have any type of like uh, unified or uh, halal standard, like national standard? In there, uh, Canada? There are initiatives mm -hmm. that have come forth, but they mostly uh, take into consideration slaughtering animals properly. Mm -hmm. Chicken, uh, cattle, lamb, that's all they kind of focus on. Mm -hmm. When it comes to identifying the individual items in the, in the label, so mm -hmm. to say, it's not here. Mm -hmm. This is something, for example, in Malaysia, mm -hmm. they have a system, the Sharia Accord, the Jakim, J A K I M. Mm -hmm they have refined a system whereby they will label something as halal, right? Mm. Some people laugh at their system, but I'm very proud of that system. Mm. 
Sometimes you'll even find the water stamped halal. People laugh. Why is the water stamped halal? I found it funny at first. Yeah. But what the, what the term halal, what they actually mean is that this water was not purified with anything that's haram. Because mm. most companies, you know, in that part of the world, when they purify water, there's like a three or four layer system. The very first one is with pig bristles. So the water shoots to the pig bristles. Oh. It takes all the things apart. Then it finally gets to the last filtration cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're telling you, okay, it's halal, meaning there's none of this there. Why do they have to use pig bristles? My guess is as good as yours, Shaykh, subhanAllah. Yeah, yeah. But look at that. Like, I, yeah. I, I, when I heard about that, I was like, you know what? Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you. Yeah. And likewise, you'll find, uh, for example, in the capsules for the medicines, stamped halal, meaning the gelatin that they're using is halal gelatin, mm. for example. Another example, for example, the shoes, the insoles, stamped yeah. halal. You're not going to eat it. Yeah. But what they mean by this is that it's proven not to be khanzir. Mm. So they're very keen on this thing. In fact, it's off topic a little bit. When in the university there, um, I was doing my master's in this topic. One of our professors, he was a co-inventor of a device. I'm praying to Allah that it comes here so I can have it. Mm. A device is two-ended. So him and um, Dr. Irwandi and there's a few others, these are my professors there. They, they created this device that on the one end, if you take it over any type of food, it'll give you the exact porcine content just by like a sniffer. Oh, wow. It directly tells you, okay, there's this much porcine content in the item for you. Oh, wow. The other end, you turn it on, activate it, it'll sniff out any alcohol content, no matter how small, oh, just really? by sniffing it. So it's a device patented, done, created already. Oh, really? Hopefully it does come here, but then I'm sure yeah. it'll be causing a disaster here because people yeah. will be over the food, they'll find yeah. that there's pork Not only this food, stuff. they'll be on people. Like, doo, doo. <laughs> <laughs> Allah, I'm sure that's... Pig uh, alert. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah. <laughs> But no, look at that, where the, the yeah. ilm has taken them, subhanAllah, Allahu yeah. Akbar, subhanAllah. So that, that's like a standard that you can, I think is next to none, yes. what they have in uh, in Malaysia. Yes. They certify all those they, I, I countries. I saw like a, a big book that they release. Yeah. Uh, every year they have some kind of halal like yeah, conference. Yes. And then it's like an international like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like almost like a, um, from that conference, yeah. all the papers that came in, which well, was really nice. We have that, because like, I'm part of the alumni there of the, yeah. They always invite us to come, yeah. uh, take part, and you know, inshallah, the 24th, mm -hmm. I have uh, session of the Halal Foods, inshallah, in the oh, night uh, night um, It's in the same theme, so we yeah. talk about Halal issues with the, you know, the other students that are the prospective students and students that are there right now, other alumni. We talk about these issues, kind of debating what trends, uh, what should be, what, you know, items that have come now that we can assess being Halal or Haram, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, alhamdulillah. Mm. And uh, th to me, that's that is like even without mentioning other countries, you know what I'm getting at. But then overall, mm. their system is pristine, mashallah. Mm. They've done a lot of work to refine it. Yes. And um, other places, they do have systems like this, but not mm. as stringent. There's like a lot of loose ends. Mm. Like I remember when I was living in Saudi, there was quite a few products that would come in until afterwards it's like, oh don't there's a ban don't eat this food there's something inside that you should not that should that should not be there mm -hmm. like where were you guys in the beginning yeah. you imported this food in the country yeah right and they actually translate the labels so they all know what's there exactly mm. and then suddenly oh it's don't eat this mm. right so that's happened a couple of times where they've announced the only thing there they don't recall they just put a if you haven't seen the 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 uh, memo allah yeah you know because you'll you have consume that product already mm. subhanallah uh, it's less pristine there. I mean, yes. uh, Malaysia is like really, it's on a different level, subhanAllah, mashallah. What's your opinion on like foods that are labeled kosher? Well, kosher, you gotta be a little bit careful with it because um, processed kosher foods mm. that are unlike the unprocessed. If you look at the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to consume the food of Ahlul Kitab, kitab lakum. Mm. The food of the uh, Ahlul Kitab is lawful unto you. We have to ask a question, what is meant by ta'am in this ayah, right? We know for a fact, um, during Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time, that food would have been unprocessed meats, or meats that were prepared with the same ingredients everyone else had, right? Um, so for example, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to, you know, some of the homes of Ahlul Kitab, they prepared some meat for him, which he and his companions ate. Um, so that was more to the unprocessed, processed with whatever people had in al-Madin. Nothing exotic, so to say. But subhanAllah, with uh, today, we have so many items in the in the kosher foods that you have to be careful of as well. So if you want to take the ayah from the get-go, the, the meats that are slaughtered, 
by kosher standards, unprocessed, you can consume. Mm. Because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Likewise, the animal slaughtered that are lawful for us, of course, from the uh, Christians, mm. who are true Christians, and it's slaughtered, unprocessed, we can consume that as well, based on the eye of the Quran. Mm. Okay. But when it comes to process now, whether it be Christian or Jewish, mm. often than not, they add alcohol to it, even the Jews, the kosher standard. And I found this out the hard way because I happened to get myself a kosher meal mm. uh, when I was flying back from one of my trips back to Canada. Mm. So when I flip the package over, it tells you, certified by Rabbi so-and-so, mm. it's been up to standard. Mm. And then they give you the ingredients. Mm. So inside this, the, the chicken that uh, I had ordered, uh, it was um, preserved in red wine, oh. uh, uh, kosher, kosher wine. Yeah. Right? So you can't eat it then. Oh, yeah. That's najasa to me. Yeah. And you can't touch it. So you got to be careful. I mean, we don't know this over here, but many people think, oh, kosher, khalas, go eat it. But hold on a moment. And, you know, even the same with Ahlul Kitab, it's more so with Ahlul Kitab, or Christians, yeah. I mean, than with the Jews. Jews are more stringent. Yeah. The Christians are, the standards are a bit more, you know, open in that regard. Mm. But if you do find, let's say, someone who is doing hand slaughter and it's processed, you got to ask that question. What was it preserved in? Yes. Right. There's a lot that they preserve in these types of mediums because it gives flavor, it taste, enhances, you know, yes. uh, certain textures. That's what they do. Mm. Otherwise, they become very, you know, mm. tough. So they do that to, te- to you know, tenderize it. So I, don't know, I remember stuff. back in the days, um, that's the only way, like when we were kids, you could get marshmallows. Oh, yeah. Was the kosher marshmallow. Oh, yeah. Right? And then yeah. uh, that was also rare to find. Yeah, then, even now, you can't yeah. find as much. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but now, like, you can get halal. And now that you have vegan, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. You have vegan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would uh, strongly advise people to be careful of gelatin as well. Yes. Because, you know, there is some debate, but this debate is more contemporary. Okay. It's not from the Sahaba, because they didn't have yeah. this to begin with. The debate is more in terms of whether gelatin is co- completely chemically transformed okay. or simply partially transformed. Whoever believes it to be partially transformed deems it haram. Mm. And it's a, if, we, if we, let's say it's taken from pig bone or pig skin, yes. right? If it's only partially transformed, it's haram. Mm. If it's completely transformed, it's deemed halal. Um, that's of course the, the context. Now, if you look at the process it goes through, you know, just kind of summarize that process. There's a seven step process to, uh, to prepare, boil, and then uh, purify the gelatin. In essence, what it, is if I'm to summarize this up, it's basically taking a, a pig bone, okay, putting in a in, in, in a uh, hot pot, mm. for lack of a better thing, let it cook for 24 hours inside there. Mm. So now you have the settings, put it 24 hours if you can, let it boil in its own, uh, you know, with the water. Of course, you're gonna put water, you're gonna put vinegar, you're gonna put you know uh, salts and whatnot, and you close it up, let it boil for 24 hours. When you open up at 24 hours, you're not gonna find a bone inside there. You're going to find a froth mm. on top. The gelatin is essentially that. You take it, you purify that, clean it up, get rid of the smell, the scent, add some flavors, colors to it, and then you can use that to make gelatin afterwards. So to me, this is not a complete transformation because it's still pig. If it was a complete transformation, now I ask anyone who believes it to be so, to look at uh, exchanging that bone with something else. Mm. Let's say, get rid of the bone, take a pig steak, put it in the pot, same process, 24 hours, salt, vinegar, lemon, lime, whatever you put in there. 24 hours afterwards, you're not going to find a piece of meat there. Mm. You're going to find a froth and a colorless broth over there. Mm. Let's say you take the froth and the broth and then you purify it 20 times. You put some salt and sugar and some color to it. Would anyone eat that? Mm. I don't think anyone in the right mind would even touch that because to them, it's khanzir. Mm. But how come we're dif- distinguishing between the pig bone, it's halal, it's mm-hmm. okay, and the pig meat. Mm-hmm. It's all the same. If you give one one treatment, give both the same treatment, right? Do you see people who differentiate uh, the meat and the bones when it comes to like non khanzir meat, like say, uh, you know, cow beef that's not been like, yeah. you know, and not certified. Yeah. Well, I've seen some people differentiate between that. I don't know. If yeah, you know. Well, like if you know if something has beef gelatin, for example. Yeah, with beef gelatin, people will be a bit more lenient because well, maybe Ahlul Kitab mm-hmm. slaughtered that beef. There's a chance. Yeah. yeah. Especially with the opinion that says whatever is the slaughtered halal here. Lottery. Yes. So <laughs> I, I don't accept that. I'm more yeah. strict with it. So if I see gelatin, yeah. I'm repelled by it immediately. Yeah. And well, but I, you know what's yeah. coming out more so is um, 
gelatin from seafood. Yeah. The, That's becoming more common. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, doctor, there's something that uh, kind of hit my mind right now, subhanAllah, in Australia. When I was there, because mm. we were looking for my kids, at that time were quite young, mm. and they wanted to have yogurt. It's, you know, the yogurt, the kids' yogurt? Yeah, yeah. The squirt yeah. yogurt? Here you can't have that because mo most of it has gelatin. Yes. There's only a few brands. So we went to Australia, I said, subhanAllah, I'm not sure what's here. We yeah. entered the main market store, public market, yeah. and I'm looking at these squirt poles, there's your plate, all these things that I know, poles is not here, but mm. your plate is here. I turn it around, and I have the images, halal gelatin. Wow. And it's not from Muslim, this is marketed across the country, yes. halal gelatin. Yeah. The Paul's one, halal gelatin. I started grabbing, I'm like, all oh, halal, Allah. Yeah. You start taking them all, I, all <laughs> take them back with you. Took everything else in the suitcase. <laughs> Do you have anything to declare? <laughs> halal gelatin. <laughs> It's all this yogurt. Just, just go. I can't deal with this. <laughs> the kids enjoyed it. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually tasted good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that surprised me. So, subhanAllah, what difference is there between Australia yeah. and Canada? There, in these issues, they're more unified, mm. united together. We demand this. Oh, wow. They got it. Here, yeah. we're all. You yeah. can't even agree on a certain. We don't have simple a I, That's what I find. It's like there's so many different committees and organizations yeah. doing right. this halal certification. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, there's but what nothing, are they certifying? Yeah, there's nothing consistent. They're certifying just the meat that's going to be slaughtered. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, nothing. When it else. comes to anything else, they don't certify. They don't have a yeah. body or system. Yeah. So you have to have yeah. something you put in place. So my idea was to bring the Jackham system here. Mm. Just take it, import it, bring it here. Yeah. And use that system for everything that we have in. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Definitely, subhanAllah. Yeah. The standard we need is the yeah, we need something standardized. You have to. You yeah, have to. we yeah. definitely do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That makes the life easy. Just halal. Yeah. Okay, halal, halal, finished. Yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah. And you have trusted people, transparency, you can yeah. see how it works and oh, yeah. you know, they oh, publish yeah. everything maybe on their website. You, yeah, know, you have to have research studies backing yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Everything must be there open and clear. Yeah. But overall, if you do have a system and standard in place, it makes life easier. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Well, Jazama Khair, we talked uh, some actually some very good food topics and issues in a, the best setting, I would say, in a restaurant, of course, right? Yeah. So, Mashallah, so, so, yeah, no, alhamdulillah, Jazama Khair, Sheikh, for Allah your wisdom, Allah your insight, your Allah knowledge. Allah 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 give us the tawfiq to uh, implement it and save us Ameen. from these Ameen. things that we seemingly think, oh, well, it's nothing, it's easy, it's just, you know, gummy bears, but, you know. Allah must have, alhamdulillah. All right, Jazama Khair. So, uh, We'd like to thank our audience, inshallah. We want to keep producing excellent quality programming for all of you. And remember always to live by the hub, die by the hub, and just when you think life is stuck, tune in to Life Hub. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection, or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah.